Afternoon, how we doing? Wow, there's a lot of people here. Let me put on Harry's glasses and see how they work. I'd like to have a conversation with you today. Um, it's great to be here. It's great to be back in San Diego. I do want to say that in the Navy, you know, you go to boards and you're not supposed to hold people accountable for homesteading tours, you know. Um, and so, but it appears to me it, 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 people do hold people that, you know, are Mayport snuggle bunnies, Norfolk snuggle bunnies, they always say, but no one gets accused of homesteading here in San Diego. And I don't know why that is. I just haven't figured that out yet. Dave Buss, you will be leaving. I just want you to, regardless of what you said. Um, thanks for having us here today, and I want to talk to you today uh, about what we call predictability and adaptability. Um, uh, and you'll see why here in a second. Now, I'm going to throw some PowerPoint slides at you. I predominantly do that because it really upsets my good friend Jim Mattis. And uh, so if we can uh, poke at that ganglia, eye, we're going to do so. But there's some key points that we want you to take away, and we'll be able to give you these slides should you want them. And then if you're writing an article, the words will be correct. Uh, but I'm not going to read slides to you. We're going to have a discussion. And then we're going to open up the floor to your questions. Because what you find interesting, I find fascinating. I enjoy the conversations. I enjoy the question and answer period. Because, uh, uh, quite frankly, I think I get more out of it than you do. All right, slide, please. This first slide I want to talk about is the long view. Some of you might have heard it, and we've tailored it, and going to tailor it a little bit for this particular audience. But uh, Pete wanted me to talk about the strategy, that this was going to be based on the strategy. And of course, they're, they're, the only strategy that we have is the event strategic guidance. And so I'm not going to talk to you about the strategy, because <clears throat> the strategy is not in my lane. I'm at Fleet Forces Command. I do readiness. I produce forces to go forward anywhere in the world. and fight and win, ready on arrival. That's what I do. And so what I want to talk to you about is how we do that and how we want to improve on that. And that process isn't going to change based on the strategy that's going to come out. Because the strategy that's going to come out is going to be based on the need, there's going to, regardless of it, like in any strategy, there's going to be a need for naval forces, the need for the Navy and the Marine Corps to be out and about. As we look at coming out of 12 years of combat, land combat, and we're refocusing on the Pacific, the demand for naval forces is going to go even greater than it is today. And the reason is, is that the naval forces, we bring to bear capability that none of the other services have the ability to bring. We bring our own access. And there's two types of access. There's both physical and political access. And those are two different types of access, and you need to think of them that way. You need either physical presence or political presence in order to do something. And as long as we're 12.1 nautical miles, maybe a little closer if you do something else, um, uh, we, we bring physical and political access. And we bring to bear relevant combat power that can fight and win on arrival anywhere in the world. Right? As we look at the refocus to the Pacific, I think it's a, it, the Navy has never stopped fo refocusing on the Pacific in those 12 years. We continue to send our very best, our most modern capability, out to forward deployed forces. We have most of our Navy migrating to the, to the, uh, to the Pacific. And so we have never stopped. When I think of the refocusing of the Pacific that came out of Defense Strategic Guidance two years ago, right, two, three years ago, uh, I think the most important piece of that is the intellectual shift inside Washington, D.C., where for the last 12 years they have been rightfully focused on fighting and winning the wars that we're in and the land wars that they're in. And now it's that intellectual focus that we look to the Pacific, the critical place of uh, critical part of the world uh, that we know we're going to be heavily engaged in. The demand for naval forces. What are we going to be doing when we get there? You know, when you really think about it, naval forces and our forward deployed naval component commanders, we're really good at phase zero and phase one. We actually size our headquarters, four deployed headquarters, at phase zero and phase one. And we're the best naval, uh, components of any of the services, I will here to tell you, in phase zero and phase one. 
We're all forward deployed. We live there. We work with our partner nations out there. The challenge with that is, is um, that gives us a problem because we're not sized to go bigger than that. We're sized for phase zero, phase one. And so we're not, our manpower and our size, we're not sized to go to, to phase two, phase three. And we're going to talk about how we're going to solve that particular problem. But the forces we send forward um, are going to be very busy over the next decades. In phase zero and phase one, you can look at every study that happens to be out there, and when Christine had her a uh, couple jobs ago, she could, she could quote them uh, chapter and verse, is that we do crisis response. We sail to crisis. And we're first on the scene to crisis. And the reason we're first on the scene to crisis is because we're already there. We are forward deployed. Okay? So we go to where there is a crisis. We will continue to be uh, rushed to crisis because we go there and we have the ability to bring relevant, the threat of relevant combat power to bear, Navy and Marine Corps, to stop the crisis and de-escalate it, or if necessary, take it to the next level because we bring relative combat power to bear and our leadership doesn't have to ask permission to use it. We just did this with the Nimitz Strike Group, who is on its way home from a deployment supporting OEF, and uh, keeping Iran at bay in the Central Command AOR, was turned around for Syria, the full-up strike group, Nimitz, her air wing, and all of her cruisers and destroyers were turned around into the Red Sea and then sailed into the Med to stem and bring the, the Syrian crisis to bear to allow the inspectors in to be able to get the chemical weapons out. It worked, and we know that the threat of the, the bringing that relative combat power to bear and the ability to not have to ask permission caused the other guy to blink. Not to mention Nimitz got a med cruise, a med port visit, which is not a bad thing. Last time they did that, I was a lieutenant on her. So, um, uh, and then they went on home. And we extended, we surged her in order to do that. So we're gonna continue to be very, very busy. What about uh, the world out there? I have no idea where those crises are going to be. I'm a producer of readiness. All I know is, is that when I turn out those forces, they have to be able to fight and win at the high end. We don't have the size of the Navy that we used to. We're not going to have the time to ramp up in training to send our Navy forward. Our surge Navy is already forward deployed. The surge carrier should something heat up in Harry's AOR is going to come out of the Central Command. That's where the nearest carrier is going to be. The surge carrier, if something heats up in Fozzie Miller's AOR, is probably going to come out of the Pacific. We have to train to the same standard. As Pink Floyd said today, we train to the same standards, to the same high end, to be able to open and hold battle space and fight and win. And we have to be able to do that with everything that we send overseas. So that's where I think the strategy is. Where, regardless of what the strategy is going to do, I know in the production of readiness and the training of naval forces that however it's going to be, the missions that we are going to have to be able to perform and the standards that they have to be trained to will not change. However, if you look in the upper right, what about the economic? Coming out of every major conflict, there's a 27 to 32 percent reduction in the DOD budget. This goes back all the way to the Revolutionary War. And I know, Pete, there wasn't a DOD in the Revolutionary War. I know that. All right. Um, but that fact remains. Budget Control Act of 2011 was $499 billion over 10 years. That's a 10 to 12 percent reduction, of temp depending on how hard you cipher. Okay, so there's another 10 percent coming, at least. We know that. We're not the first people leaders to go through an economic downturn in our budget coming out of major conflict. And so we have two potential courses of actions as we work with this. We can sit around and we complain, can complain or we can lead and we're choosing to lead on how we're going to do that. Which brings us down now to the lower left hand corner. There is change. The change is coming out of major conflict, land conflict and having to be able to do, execute the missions that we're going to have to execute for whatever the strategy has, and we know what those naval missions are going to be. That's the change. Because of the economic downturn, that means we're going to have to make some really tough choices to account for those changes. 
How are we going to be able to do the nation's bidding with reduced dollars with an increase in naval demand? Which brings me to the predictability and adaptability of this schedule. We need, over the last seven years, we've gotten, we, have, we have eliminated any predictability in our readiness generation model. Now, our readiness generation model that we use is called the Fleet Response Plan. It used to be called the Interdeployment Training Cycle. At other times, it was the Turnaround Plan. We just choose to call it the Fleet Response Plan. All right, that's what, but it's our force generation model. And it is a, it is a uh, to the Air Force and to the Marine Corps, it is a hollow force generation model. Because in our fleet response plan, we always send people out at the proper readiness levels, but when they come back, we take them down to the lowest readiness level. And then we choose to elevate the readiness over time. It is a cyclic readiness model, and by the Air Force and the Marine Corps standards, it is a hollow model. It is not for us. We choose to go hollow. We choose to go into what we call the bathtub of lower readiness and then train ourselves up as we go forward. Because we keep 30, 38, 35, 38% of our Navy forward deployed all the time, this is the only way we can match the means with the way we do our business. Okay. Lastly, as we work these, and I want to talk to you about this readiness generation model and how we are going to go after um, uh, the, the choices we are making to be able to do the missions in the upper left-hand corner. The last thing, the choices that we have to make, we need to think long-term. We can't make decisions based on today. We need to think long-term, think over the long view, the choices that we are making today, we have to understand the second and third order effects long term. Okay? The most important element the Air Boss talked about today, it's our people. They're the secret weapon. They're the secret weapon. When we stir in the sauce on top of them, which is training, they are our most capable people. We take the best American industry can provide, we give them the proper training, okay? We take the very best of the youth of America, give them the proper training, and I tell you, they do amazing things here. So the choices that we make, we have to really understand the impacts on the people on the long-term long -term view here. Okay? Slide, please. Now, over the last six, seven years, we have really been working pretty hard. And the uh, Air Boss and the Sea Lord were talking about that today. We've been working pretty hard. And in order to meet the operational demand, we have blown up the predictability in our fleet response plan. We would rewrite the schedule, rewrite availabilities to do whatever it takes to meet the demand of the combatant commanders. And as a result of it, if you look on the, from the fleet perspective, we have lost predictability. We have lost the predictability for our sailors and our families. We've lost the predictability for those of us that produce readiness and for the readiness consumers for the combatant commanders. But I asked for this audience, we went out to the, sh to the ship and the aviation industry to get their industry perspective of this loss of predictability and the consequences of it. Because if we understand the, con uh, the, the root causes of these predictabilities, of, of losing the predictability of our process, then we can go after and knock down the barriers, put the positions in place to fix them. So I don't want to read it to you, but at the end of the day, we have lost the key element here for our people. We have lost the predictability for our sailors and our families. And, and because of the way we have adjusted our readiness generation model, we have lost the adaptability that we need to put into it to account for that uncertain future in, in, over, the, over the decade ahead of us. Slide, please. So we've come up with this thing called the Optimized Fleet Response Plan, or OFRP. All right. <clears throat> How did we come up with that name? I have no idea, so don't ask, okay? But we did, Devo did it. Anyway, so we came up with the optimized FRP, and we have the, the, uh, identified lines of effort in our force generation model that we are tackling in order to produce ready forces and fix the predictability and adaptability of our force, readiness force generation model. We call this the layer cake, and we're gonna start from the bottom of this layer cake of all of the elements of the fleet response plan. And we started uh, to tackle this by fixing the carrier strike group. Now the carrier strike group 
is the aircraft carrier. All of the type model series, the squadrons are, that are in the air wing that are on that air, aircraft carrier, and all of the cruisers and destroyers that are assigned to that, car to that carrier strike group. In addition to, we are adding in additional BMD and independent deployers assigned to that particular strike group. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the weapon system when you combine it with the operational headquarters, the tactical headquarters, the naval, the, which are the numbered fleet commanders, the four deployed number fleet commanders, and the strike group commanders and the subordinate, sta uh, subordinate commanders underneath them. That is the weapon system, as soon as we also attach the MPA and the, and the fast attacks to it. That is a weapon system. It's not an F-18, it's not an Arleigh Burke. What I've just described to you, that all of that stuff and the, and the t operational and tactical headquarters are the weapon system that are able to open and hold battle space. We tackled that because if we tackle and fix that part of the weapon system, of the carrier, the air wing, and the cruisers and destroyers, that solves about 80, 85 percent of our Navy. Um, and we put in place the elements that we're going to need to fix the rest of our Navy. And the first thing we had to do in this effort, the first layer of the, of the, of the layer cake, was to fix all of those forces to the same FRP length. Currently, the, uh, uh, the cruisers and destroyers were on a 27-month FRP. They just changed, they changed to a 32-month FRP cycle about, uh, about uh, this time last year, two years ago. And, um, but the carriers were operating on a 36-month cycle. So right off the bat, we lost unit integrity of the weapon system, and we, lost, and we broke down the chain of command that can help that weapon system work its way through the FRP cycle. So the first thing we did was identify put them all on the same FRP length, okay? And the bullets on the bottom of the slide are the real buzzwords. For this, in our FRP cycle, we have a maintenance phase, we have a training phase broken up into basic and advanced, and then we have a deployment stage, and after the deployment stage, there's a sustainment phase before you go back into maintenance. That's the cycle, maintenance to maintenance. And so for the sunk cost, the maintenance and training is a sunk cost. Before we push them out, we're going to do the maintenance right, and we're going to do the training right, train them to the right level, and those are sunk costs. So then the question, qu next question is, for those sunk costs of maintenance and training, how, how much A sub O, how much forward presence can I get for those sunk costs, and still with a clean chain of command, it's very important, you got to get chain of command right, and still have an acceptable purse tempo that's going to keep, retain, attract and retain the sailors and our families, which are the backbone of our Navy. Simple as that. How much A sub O for the sunk cost and an acceptable PERS tempo? The next thing we have to fix is the C2, the command and control. I was trained by uh, Tim Keating and Dave Nichols, and they taught me uh, 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 one thing loud and clear. If you get two things right, everything's going to be okay. If you get command and control right and you get commander's intent right, everything's going to be okay. Right, General? If you get that right, people, if you know who you're working for and what the boss wants you to do, all else will work out, okay? So we have to get that command and control right, and that command and control, what's important about this, that command and control, everybody in that chain of command, has to be focused at the same point in the FRP cycle at the same time, so that the emphasis of the chain of command is there. So if they're all in maintenance, that chain of command is all focused on maintenance. When it's time to train, they're all focused on training. And when it's time to go forward, deploy, and fight, that's what we need to do. Okay, the next thing is, is we need to fix manning. Once we've got the cycle right, we get the chain of command right, we have to fix the manning and the individual training. We have to make sure that the commands, the squadrons and the ships, are manned at the right level with the right skill set, with the right rank and rate at the right time in the FRP cycle. Getting the leading petty officer a week before deployment, when he needed to be there through the maintenance and the training phase and the, and the certification phase, it, it's just it's too late. And that's how we're doing it right now. We're not getting the right people. We're overmanned ashore and undermanned at sea, and we have to fix that. A key element of that is not just that they're, they're there at the right time. They have to be, the pipeline training has to train them to the skill sets that they need in order to, to do their mission that they're going to do for that particular sea tour. The next thing we have to fix is maintenance and modernization. All right? Sea Lord talked about it today. The Navy of 2025, we already own between 75 and 80 percent of it, depending upon whether it's a ship or an airplane in the class of ship and the age of the airplane. 
So average that out, that's, you're a STEM major, that's 77.5, right? So 77.5 of our Navy, we already own in the Navy of 2025, all right? So what we have to make sure is that they are, that they can make it to 2025 and that when they're there at 2025, they can fight and win, that we have modernized them correctly to be able to fight and win. And we have to make the right choices on the 25%, 100 minus 77, I'm not gonna do the public math, but you all can. And um, that we, that's the new stuff that we need to buy. So we have to make that necessary fix, the ma maintenance and modernization. And the maintenance schedule has to work. The ships have to get on, in on time, they have to come out on time. In order to do that, we've gotta do a lot of work to make sure we do the necessary planning in order to get that right. After we do the maintenance and modernization, we have to get the parts on the ships and in the squadrons. They gotta have the parts. They gotta have the right parts at the right time um, uh, so that a sailor doesn't have to wait to get the part that the sailor needs in order to make his ship or his airplane right. Nothing's more dissatisfying than not being given the right tools. So we gotta make sure we fix that right. Then after we do that, we have to do an inspection process because you inspect what's important. Okay, you inspect what's important. But we don't wanna over inspect. We want to inspect the right thing at the right time, test it that it's at the right time. After that, we go into training at the unit and the advanced level, and the whole chain of command is focused on the, on the, on the right, right level of training at the right time. I don't want to do basic level training in the advanced phase of training. I want it done in the basic phase of training. I don't want just-in-time training. It needs to be synchronized, building to the capability that we need. And then finally, the operational and tactical headquarters. We have to standardize we have to standardize the way we train our, our forward deployed naval component commanders to fight at phase two and phase three and the subordinate commands. We have to do a better job of that, okay? Now I'm gonna walk through a couple of these things here for you and uh, to tell you why these are so important. Slide, please. <clears throat> and we'll have kneeboard cards for you of that particular slide in the kill chain, of course. All right, FRP length to get the maximum for the operational availability. We're aligning uh, that strike group that we talked about to a 36 month FRP cycle. And that goes from maintenance to maintenance, okay? From when you start your maintenance availability to the, to the time you start your next maintenance availability. It's supply based. What does that mean? Supply based means we're gonna be able to generate so much forward presence with our cruisers and our destroyers and our carriers and our air wings in this particular model. That's all it's gonna produce. It's gonna produce an eight month deployment in a 36 month cycle, okay? That's all it's gonna produce and that's all we're buying for, okay? It's the maximum forward presence with the available capacity and funding, okay? So for the sunk cost over here of maintenance and the, all of the crew devs are done inside the carrier's uh, time and we have to make sure we get that right. The basic level's done, we've expanded it for our crew devs. The advanced phase is, is a full up weapon system and they, there's a POM period here, and then they go on an eight-month deployment, and now they're in a sustainment cycle. And that's an eight-month deployment. Now, where did we come up with this model? And we did it a year ago when the last Deputy Secretary of Defense asked us if we could generate four carrier strike groups out and about. How would we do that? And the plan that we came up with working with OpNav was called the Enhanced Carrier Plan. And what we were gonna do was a seven, seven, and seven model. For maintenance and training, we're gonna deploy for seven months, we're gonna be home for seven months, and we're gonna go out for another seven month deployment. Okay? It generated a lot of A sub O. We were up to about 3.8 out and about carrier strike groups. There was a real problem with it. It cost a lot. We were burning up ships, we were burning up airplanes, and we were using up aircraft carrier core life before their time, which means we had to refuel them sooner, and they weren't also then gonna to get to, to, uh, uh, to 50 years like the experiment on Enterprise did. So um, it was really expensive. And after sequestration hit, no one asked us about ECP anymore. <laughs> I'm shocked about that. But what we learned from it is how we have uh, come up with the optimized FRP. Now, you can't see it if you're an LSO in the back, but uh, uh, the ECP was based on a 7-7-7. Seven, seven, and seven. OFRP puts out an eight-month deployment. And what's important in that three, six years, uh, in that uh, period of time, is how much your, what we call home port tempo. Home port tempo is the opposite of the operation tempo, but it's the, it's the time away from home. 
from home station, from home port, throughout the entire uh, FRP cycle. We know this number. We know how long people are away from, from home, whether it includes schools or the training time away from home. And in the uh, uh, enhanced carrier plan, they were going to be home 49% of the time. CNO's red line for this, or, or limit for this, is 50%. So we're just going to exceed that. In this eight-month deployment in a 36-month cycle, they're going to be home 68% of the time. Now, why is that important for us? Because I think eight months is the ragged edge of what sailors and their families will be able to hold on to. We're currently deploying for nine, uh, nine months for carriers uh, and ARG MUSE and our BMD ships. We're, cho we're choosing them up. It is not a sustainable model in order to do it, in order to meet this. <clears throat> so we think we can get it back to eight months, and we'll have it back to eight months in about two or three years as we implement the optimized FRP. And we can do that given the number of denominators that we have of those particular forces, the number of uh, carriers or the number of amphibs that we have, number of BMD ships. And we think over an eight-month deployment over a three-year period, when you are home 68% of the time, is something that we can, we can convince our sailors that it's going to be there. It has the predictability. They know what their schedule is going to be. They know when they're going to be home. And they know when they're going to go out for a long deployment. What the sailors and their families don't like is not knowing when they're leaving or when they're coming back. They understand if they have to surge, and they've got to stay longer on deployment. If it's the nation's business, it's why they join the Navy in order to do that. But not being able to give them that predictability. OK? So build, please. So what by this is this entire FRP cycle is very, very predictable. It gets us an acceptable amount. We're able to meet the global demand for 15 um, right now in order to do this for our cruisers and our destroyers and our carriers and our airways. Uh, and it's very predictable in order to do it. We, we, it's very predictable for the industrial base. We get people home on time so that they can go through their availabilities on time, well planned to get out on time to go through this particular cycle. Um, next slide. But why is it adaptable? We don't have to blow it up. If we have to surge, we don't have to blow up our FRP cycle. Okay? Because on the back side of this deployment, there is additional deployment we can surge. And we are making the necessary investments that all we have to do is do additional training, and we know how much that costs in order to push them out the door to generate more forward presence should the, should the need arrive. So with a, we have the ability, once again, to generate more if the COCOMs need it and the Secretary of Defense, Defense wants to send them. We can send more forward presence out there and when they come and get them back on time and not blow up all the rest of the elements that produces our force generation model. Slide, please. Manning. Have to fix Manning. <clears throat> the, you can look at the words on what we're doing it, but what the goal is, is right here is our Manning level. This is maintenance, basic, advanced, deployed, and sustainment. And you can see where the Manning levels that we're achieving today right now. Okay? We want to be at about 90, 90 uh, somewhere between 90 and 95% fit fill, NEC fill, right sailor at the right time. And the CNO is making the necessary investments, CNP, Billy Moran's on point to make this happen, to incentivize the sea duty to get our sailors on time at the ship so that as they come out of maintenance, we're at maintenance, we have the ships manned up at the 90% level, fit fill, NEC fill, and then that ship can now go through the training phase and go on deployment. This is a big deal. And those are the means, the ways that we're going about doing it. And uh, we're going to start with the Harry S. Truman. When she goes into her next, and when she comes back off of deployment, she'll be back here in about six weeks to two months. When she goes into that maintenance avail, we'll have everything in place, all the policy changes, procedures changes, everything we need to do to start manning them, their full up strike group. Uh, to these particular levels. And then every strike group after that, we will be manning them to these particular levels. Slide, please. Maintenance and modernization aligned to the carrier strike group, extending the surface force readiness manual, which is a game changer force to 36 months aligned in there. That's when your ship would, would make it. With a stable planning effort, Willie Hilardis at Nav C is on point on this one to make it work, okay, that we do the necessary planning. Whether we think we'll have the funding for the availability or not, we, dirty little secret, we always get the funding. So the planning can keep going. See, Lord, was it, what was the difference? How many lost ship years we went from last year to this year? 
12 to 7 lost ship years because we, even though in the uncertainty of sequestration, we still did the availabilities, okay? So we want to do that necessary planning. Raise your hand if you're part of the, the maintenance and modernization for our ships in here. If you're part of that, if you're part of that system, we're going to give you the necessary planning that you need. We want to do that planning and do the necessary integrating, the synchronization of the different packages so that we can go in on time and come out on time. All right? Doing the same thing for airplanes. Slide. The next thing is the parts. It's important about this slide. This is what we man the fleet today in the parts lockers as they progress through basic, intermediate, and, and deployment. And then off deployment, we take all your parts down. That's what we do today, all right? But we're making the necessary investments right now that when you come out of maintenance, your parts level is up here at about 90%, and we're going to hold it until you go back into maintenance again. All right, so the key here in the sustainment piece, we have the people in there, we've trained them, they have the parts, they go on deployment, we don't take the parts off. So now all we got to do is pour in a little bit more training time, because the people are there, they're properly trained, the parts are there, the maintenance has been done, and we can generate more A sub O. Slide, please. Inspections. Boy, if we pull this one off, I'm going to get our coins back, I promise. All right? On the upper left-hand corner, our carriers and our cruisers and destroyers and our PCs and our minesweeps in an FRP cycle currently have over 466 individual inspections through their FRP cycle. They're not synchronized to anywhere in the FRP cycle. They, uh, the source document that generates the requirement for the inspection, some of them are uh, some command called sync land fleet. I don't have a clue who that is, all right? There has been no discipline in this particular process. And so CNO has been kind enough to designate Fleet Forces Command as the executive agent for fleet assessment. I'm an executive uh, agent for a lot of things for CNO. It's, if it's got too many stovepipes and you need to close the stovepipes and close the seams, give it to FFC, call them an executive agent, go fix it. So that's what we do in FFC, all right? And I'm really excited about this one because what we want to do is validate what inspections we do, who's doing the inspections, decide what standard we're going to do, and use each, each, each other's inspectors if it's the right thing to do. And if we choose to do multiple inspections on the same thing, it's, that decision is made at the right level. And it's aligned to where you are in your FRP cycle. All right? Slide, please. Who's been through an in-serve here? Raise your hand. A lot of fun, wasn't it, Pete? Yeah. He is nose. Ooh. Went right here. All right? So in-serve has gone already from five to three and a half days, and we think we can get it down to three days because we're using the TICOMS inspection model that's done every FRP cycle, which is just like the, it's the identical inspection of an in-serve model, modeled after the surface force readiness manual that has the right inspection at the right time. We're inspecting to the same standards. We trust each other's data. We're going to get much better information. And we do the right inspection at the right time. We had this thing called fire all guns on in serves before where they had to fire all guns. It didn't matter to me that if you go out in the basic phase and fire all guns, that doesn't tell me anything. That just tells me that a round came out the front end. What matters to me is the end-to-end -end test of that weapon system. So at the end of COM2X, during COM2X of the, of the Bush strike group, COM2X, we do our second integrated live fire event to go after small boats. And uh, if we could slip the one, this is from Phil C, shooting a five-inch gun against a, it is remotely piloted. That is an end-to-end -end test of fire all guns. Because it doesn't matter if it comes out, it's got a fuse on target. And if it fuses on target, that means everybody did their job right. And that's the test that matters to us, right, Pink? That's the only test that matters. The next one, and uh, clip the right one, this is a laser JDAM with a VT fuse from a Super Hornet. That's an end-to-end -end test. And if you don't like that, you got issues. Slide, please. All right, training is the last one. It's the adaptability. We don't know where the forces are going to be, but they have to be trained to the high end to the right standard to fight and win at the high end, Whether, whatever coast they happen to go to. 
They get trained to the same missions, functions, and tasks. The only difference is between what Pink puts them through in their advanced phase of training on the West Coast and what we put them through in the advanced phase of training on the East Coast is because the training ranges are different. But the missions, functions, and tasks that they're being trained to are to the same standard to be able to fight and win wherever they happen to go. Okay? So in the, uh, in the unit level, everybody's aligned um, uh, to the right level. They're all being focused at the right level. We do the right basic, phase, uh, the right basic training that leads to the advanced phase of training. And then the integrated train phase, a standardized, rigid group sale. On the East Coast, we take a break and then go out for the advanced phase of training in COMP2X. We're going to change the name of COMP2X because we don't understand what COMP2X means today. Uh, but on the West Coast, Pink sometimes has to do the basic phase and the advanced phase together to shorten it up. But the point is, is that it's, it is a syllabus-based approach, training to the right mission functions and tasks so that they can train out, um, uh, they, can tr- they can fight and win wherever they happen to go. We also, in that, are focusing uh, very hard on the standardization of the training of the four deployed Naval Component Commanders uh, to be able to fight from phase zero to phase four and win. Slide, please. So that's the optimized FRP. Here's the layer cake on it. We're now working with MAR-4COM on the, on the uh, amphibious ready groups and the Marine Expeditionary Units. The thing that we have to figure out is that FRP length, the right FRP length, using those same, the same bumper sticker that you see down there. What is the right FRP length? Because it's got to match both the Navy and the Marine Corps needs. And we have to come to agree, and Rick Tryon and, and my staff are working real hard to find that right FRP length. But everything else that you see there, all of the procedures and all the policies are all in play for the Amphibious Ready Group and the Marine Expeditionary Unit. Doing the same thing for our MPA, we're doing it for our submarines, we're doing it for our NC, NECC forces, and we realize we need to do it for our four deployed naval forces. And so PAC Fleet's on point for, the, for their four deployed naval forces, and we'll help Sixth Fleet and Fifth Fleet for theirs, because they too have an FRP cycle that has all of those elements in it. And we have to make sure we get those elements right for the four deployed naval forces. And with that, I'll now take your questions. Free shot at a four star. From a. Uh, How tall are you? Oh, I'm almost six feet. <laughs> I like you. From a from a missile crisis medical officer, I would like to know if you have any comments about the present uh, medical support that the fleet is getting. It's fabulous. Slide, please. Thank you. (laughs) I didn't ask you to put this up here, but uh, one of my very best friends, Brick Nelson, is in Balboa as we speak, works for Northrop Grumman. He's not, he would be out here. And uh, he has been very, very ill. And he's out at Balboa, and this is the team um, from uh, Admiral Gillingham. Doc Gillingham used to be our surgeon of fleet forces that's taken exceptional care of Brick. And that's the kind of care they give every one of our sailors and our Marines. So I hope that answered your question. Yes, I'm glad I'm still a volunteer there. Thank you. Fair enough. We should all be so blessed to have friends like Brick Nelson and our families get the care that they get at our, through our Navy medicine system. Back up, please. Next question. Boy, that was a softball. Okay, Pete. I don't know if this one will work. Oh, here we go. Yep. Um, Admiral, you talked about going to a supply side system, and yet we have history here. And the history is that you can put a block on the fleet response plan that says, here's where you add more if you need more. But the history over the past 12 to 13 years in particular has been if there's a slot there and you can, you can generate readiness, then the global force management demand uh, 
tends to win out. Okay. So you're going to supply side. Is anybody else read into that? I did not ask him to ask this question. Let me explain for the audience how uh, we meet the, how the demand signal is generated and how we meet it. Once a year, the combatant commanders and the joint staff and the services work on developing what they call the global force management, what's the map mean? Gift map. Allocation, Allocation plan. And it is a supply-based model. The uh, services say this is what we can produce, and the combatant commanders have a much bigger demand than that, and it's supply-based, and that's what the 365-day-a-year schedule is written on. There's another process because the world gets a vote. And sometimes the COCOMs have a shortfall to meet that need to answer to the voting booth. And that is the process they use is the uh, request for forces, the RFF process. That is a demand-based model. So the issue here is not that the uh, gift map process is broken. It's that the, it is when it goes from a supply-based model to a demand-based model, and the Secretary of Sense says CENTCOM or PACOM or UCOM or AFRICOM or SOUTHCOM, or we don't give anything a sink, um, uh, uh, needs more stuff, then we have to generate it. And what's happened over these last years is that we've broken our force generation model in order to meet that demand. And so what the optimized FRP does in that sustainment phase, we are able to generate more forward presence should the demand be there, either extend them on deployment or send them back out if that's there. And we don't have to blow up our force generation model in order to meet it. So that's the, that's the adaptability of the optimized FRP. That's the important piece of it. Um, uh, all of the other elements are fixing things that needed to be fixed. None of it looked new. A lot of that didn't look new to you, did it, Pete? It's the way we were brought up, right? And, uh, uh, but the ability to answer the needs of the COCOMs, because they're responsible uh, if something goes wrong. You know, who's accountable? Who's accountable? Who, who's held responsible if things don't go wrong? First off, it's the chief of naval operations if it's naval forces. Cobar Towers, Cole, who testified? It wasn't the central, uh, the central Command commander. It was the Chief of Naval Operations or the Chief of Staff of the Air Force. So Admiral Greener thinks he's, he's accountable. He wants, to fix, he wants to make sure that they can succeed. Just read his sailing directions. We're fighting forward ready. And then the other ones uh, that, are, that are held accountable are the COCOMs and then from our service, the Naval Component Commanders. So if they have a need, we need to be able to make sure that they are successful. Um, they own the risk. We don't own the risk. Okay? So that's the, that, and I think that's the rub. Now, there's not enough people talking about supply based model. And the reason is the world gets a vote. And that's why. Okay? Thank you. Yep. Next question, please. Come on. There's got to be more than this. I got one. It doesn't have to be to optimized FRP. This is a free shot at a four-star and whatever you want to talk about. I got one. Okay. Um, Where is this? That's, that's right, right here. Oh. <laughs> Whoops. Oh. <laughs> um, people are a big part of this. You've tipped on that, touched on that. Tell me what, uh, tell us what uh, really bothers you about, uh, what, what is your top concern, top of your list of things you got to get right that are troublesome and uh, aren't getting the kind of attention you'd like or... Give us a feel for the, the gravity of uh, some of the things you're challenged with. Okay. Um, it's fixing the elements in the op of the layer cake of the optimized FRP. Every one of those is in my bucket list. I came down here to try and fix. Um, uh, uh, very, very little of it, except for the training at the very top, standardized training at the very top, is the way we used to do business. And uh, we need to go back to the way we used to do business. Um, and so we're working our tails off to take PowerPoint slides and move them into, into actionable material, that it's working. And uh, we're going to be successful. We're going after it. And the CNO is back, you know, he said he's going to deliver on optimized FRP, and he is putting his money where his mouth is. So we're going to fix it. Okay? The challenge is, the challenge is, the, uh, uh, the, in the economic downturn, and I call it an economic downturn from DOD's perspective, right, um, is that we have more stuff 
then we have the means to maintain and train and deploy the stuff. Okay? We, there's not enough money coming in. So we have to make those right choices. And there's choices that you can get rid of stuff. Or there's choices that they might give us more money, maybe, unlikely. Or we really have to understand what we're spending our money on. And so what, uh, what we feel is important is that we have to come up with better means, ways, and ends. You understand means, ways, and ends. And uh, the ends is the end state, and it's the forward deployed naval force. It's the war fighting forward ready that CNO talks about. That's the ends. The means are the things that you need in order to, ex to get there, and the ways are you got, the way you go about doing it. The optimized FRP is the way we're going after it, okay? The, to go after uh, uh, modifying the ways for the available means uh, in order to get there. Uh, what's interesting is that we've really understood, really getting down and understanding our ownership costs in Fleet Forces Command, and it's pretty fascinating. 75% of my budget is ownership costs. 15% of my budget is training costs. And only 10% of my budget is being forward deployed, is sending those forces forward. So who is it, Willie Sutton, the bank robber? Where are we going after? We're going after where the money is, understanding where those ownership costs. That's one of the things we have to do uh, that we're working very hard. The difference in training to uh, uh, a Oh, what we call uh, maritime security operations surge and training to the high end to what we call major combat operation ready. The difference in costs is minuscule, right? But going after those elements uh, in maintenance and modernization, and, uh, uh, which is a lot of our ownership costs, that's where we have to go after. And, and we can't afford not to do optimized FRP. Go ahead, Pete. Admiral, we have just. Uh you're a little bit over, but you have one more person at the mic if you want okay. to take a final question back Sure. Here. Afternoon, Admiral. How you been? Good, sir. First time I met you, you were the uh, young sir grad of ET-26 with a chip on your shoulder. Yeah. Glad to see you haven't Come changed. Come knock it bit. off, dude. That's right. You haven't changed a bit, sir. A uh, question has to do with the, could you provide some insight for the number of carriers? What is the right number of carriers? Recently, it came close to a decision not to refuel the George Washington. And I, I understand they will bring her back and send her back to Newport News for RCOH. Does that leave the Navy with a bill that we have to take out of a hide? And what is driving the 10 carrier number right now? Yeah. The, um, first off, whether it's an aircraft carrier or a cruiser or destroyer or a submarine or a P-8 or NACC forces, I've got more mission than I've got all of that stuff. Okay. I can't, I, I, I need every bit of it in order to meet the demands from the forward deployed uh, combatant commanders who own the risk from the guidance that they've been given from the Secretary of Defense in, the, in, their, in their end states. And so I, we don't want to get rid of anything. We need more, to be honest, in order to do it. Uh, the problem is, is that we have to match how much money we have in order to be able to maintain it. And if we don't figure that out, we're going to be on the HOV lane to hollow. And that's why you see the Navy has made some, uh, put up some really tough choices on getting rid of some very expensive, of, of, capa of capability and capacity that we really need in order to do our, our missions. And the question is, is when does the impact, say, of GW going away really occur? The impact occurs in about 21 when she's supposed to come back into the rotation, and we will go back to nine and 10 month deployments. It, just meeting the demand signal of keeping two carriers out and about. Um, and so that goes to the denominator. So uh, in the case of our amphibious, our amphibious shipping, our BMD ships, um, and, the, uh, uh, and the carriers and the air wings, what we call the denominator really matters in order to meet what we think the demand signal that we have to meet. Uh, a perturbation of just a single, single ship um, uh, really matters in our ability, the effect of that really matters in our ability to generate the forward presence that we need. So I hope that answered your question. Okay. Thanks for asking. Admiral, Admiral, we thank you. Can we turn on this mic? Thanks. Um, Admiral, we thank you for your time. It's precious. You came all the way out here from the East Coast in the middle of the winter. Tough. To, to be with us and no share, share with us. And we, as a token of our appreciation, we want to give you this Naval Institute Press book, Battle of Midway, Naval Institute Guide to the U.S. Navy's Greatest Victory, 
inside is an FCA bookmark. And on behalf of FCA International Naval Institute, we thank you. Thanks a lot, Shermate. Thank you.